get to the Q&A. Q and a start thinking about running. He has a mic. Yeah, and they want us to use the yeah, mic. Nice, easy drive back, right? Used up a major chip. <laughs> Rick Bush evaluations are going down. Come after section. I didn't. No, no, no. I just missed the section. Yeah. Rick Bush evaluations are coming down 0.3 on their side. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. I just said that. I, I, I think yeah. people have used some penicillin. Not by us, yeah. but generally in the country. Yeah. But it's helpful that people don't do it until there's that much more left to be said. Because yeah. yeah. it's sort of been a constant process of this to some extent. But I think Oh, yeah, no. At least they're not all sitting in a big group that they're all dragged into there together. Thank you all for coming this afternoon. Thanks to our uh, online viewers as well. Uh, the title of the conference is uh, Did 9-11 Change Everything, Anything? And uh, the theme of this panel is uh, how do we look at the world? So how did 9-11 change the way that Americans view the world? How did it change the way that we go about foreign policy? Uh, and we have an excellent panel today to discuss that. Uh, to my left, we have Peter Fever. He's a professor of political science and public policy here at Duke. Uh, he directs the American Grand Strategy Program, uh, which we teach together in the fall. Uh, and he has uh, a long record of uh, public service in uh, the George W. Bush and in the Clinton administrations on the National Security Council. Uh, to his left is Bruce Gentleson, also a professor of public policy and political science. Uh, who most recently served as a uh, consultant to the State Department between 2009 and early 2011. Uh, and to his left, we have uh, Charlie Dunlap, a uh, former Major General in the Air Force, uh, who now teaches at the law school. So I'm sure they will all have plenty of interesting and provocative things to say. And I'll turn it over to Peter. Well, th well thank you, Hal. And I also want to thank those of you who came, particularly the 15 members of the section from my lecture class who look so eager to be here. I want to say that it's inspiring to me. Peter, Peter I've seen detainees that looked, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that looked more enthusiastic about their present circumstance. So the question before us is uh, what did, what changed in terms of our foreign policy uh, or did anything change? And I'm going to talk about two things that changed and two things that did not change. Uh, the first one that changed was that there was a change to America's overall grand strategy, but not as big a change as you might have thought, given the shock of 9-11. So before 9-11, if you say on November, oh, sorry, on September 10th, did we have a grand strategy? Actually, yes, there was a, a fairly coherent bipartisan grand strategy that had guided U.S. Uh, uh, basically since the end of the Cold War. 
There were four pillars to it. There was, the first pillar was the velvet-covered iron fist of resist, uh, preventing the rise of a hostile peer rival who could challenge the U.S. Uh, the way the Soviet Union had. Uh, by the velvet-covered iron fist, iron fist being maintaining defense spending way above what was needed for the immediate short-term security problems. And the velvet glove was a uh, accommodating would-be rivals seeking to tie them into the existing order by accommodating their grievances rather than by sticking uh, our primacy in their face. The second pillar was making the world look more like us politically, spreading democracy. The third pillar, making the world look more like us economically with e uh, mil uh, globalization and free markets. And the fourth pillar was identifying uh, nuclear weapons especially, but any weapons of mass destruction in the hands of hostile rogue states as our number one security concern. Uh, and those four pillars describe Bush, the father's uh, grand strategy, Clinton's strategy, and the strategy that Bush, the son, intended to pursue when he came into office, uh, although he downgraded uh, initially the spread of democracy uh, until 9-11 happened. And then at that moment, there was a chance for a grand strategy reevaluation that would have jettisoned the other four pillars and said, we're only going to do the war on terror. Or in a hypothetical world, he could have said, this is just one more uh, example of the kinds of low-level terrorism problems we had in the 90s, which were dealt primarily with the law enforcement uh, frame, so as a, a problem but not a national security uh, threat of the highest order. Uh, he could have done it that way. He didn't. Uh, instead, he said, well, we're going to elevate terrorism to uh, a national security concern of the top rank, equal to, in terms of our concerns, equal to the threat of weapons of mass destruction in the hands of rogue states. But we're not going to downgrade any of the other four. Indeed, what Bush said was that all of the other four are even more important now given in light of the, the threat from transnational networks of terror. And so we had a grand strategy that was essentially the same one as the day before, but with all of the other four pillars re-intensified and a fifth pillar, the uh, dealing with the war on terror, elevated. And as a result of this, by the way, that's one reason why defense spending was so much higher in the last decade, because you kept all of the defense spending that was needed for the other four pillars, and you added a whole new and a very expensive, expensive one. So our grand strategy changed in the sense of adding a fifth pillar, but it didn't change as much as, in retrospect, it, it might have. And in the 10th year anniversary, you see a, a number of critics saying, that the grant strategy should have been changed more dramatically after 9-11, and it wasn't. The second thing that changed, I would argue, uh, is a change in the risk calculus of the country, our willingness to wield power and a larger proportion of our power, and a willingness to wield it sooner rather than letting problems fester. Uh, this, of course, was happened in President Bush's own risk calculus quite dramatically, but I, I think it, he was reflecting a, a view that was more broadly felt across the, the public. And this, I think, is maybe the most consequential in foreign policy terms, the most consequential change that 9-11 produced. It, it resulted in a number of lines of action. The most controversial one, of course, would be the invasion of Iraq, which was directly predicated on the notion that you uh, because of in a post 9-11 world, you had to deal with problems sooner rather than letting them gather to the point where they might uh, be too dangerous to deal with. But there's, it shows up in other changes. If the, the, the 90s were characterized by uh, a casualty-averse political community, the, after 9-11 it was more of a casualty-acceptant political community. Likewise, there was a change in the equilibrium that the public said between civil liberties and uh, national security, as was discussed in the earlier panel. And you could also talk about uh, President Obama's ramped up use of drone strikes, uh, in which 
I would argue is part and parcel of the, the what was called the Bush Doctrine of, of preemption uh, or prevention. Those drone strikes are another manifestation of this changed risk calculus, that we're willing to do things in other countries, whether it's Pakistan, Yemen, uh, Somalia, that in a previous age we might not have been willing to do. Why? Because we're going to try to deal with these problems before they become unmanageable. And so those were two, I would say, significant changes in the 9-11. Two things now that didn't change. Well, the first thing I'd, I'd argue is that it didn't change how difficult it was to do foreign policy and how difficult it was to wield all elements of national power to meet the national challenges and opportunities. Uh, Bruce, my colleague here, loves to talk about the September 10th agenda, and he may even mention it uh, in a few minutes. All of the things on that September 10th agenda were hard to do on September 10th, and they were hard to do on September 12th. Uh, and indeed, working the foreign policy bureaucracy was as, was as hard to do before, I think, as it was after. L let me pick a couple examples. Foreign aid. Still very difficult to do foreign aid effectively. After 9-11, President Bush doubled the development budget over what it had been uh, in the Clinton years. Uh, and yet, at the end, also revolutionized the way development aid was uh, to be administered with the Millennium Challenge um, Corporation. And at, at the end of that time, when President Obama came in, he said, we're still not doing foreign aid well. And they've done an even more extensive attempt at reforming foreign aid. And I would, I would say that they would themselves agree that it's still very difficult and, and probably the results are uh, equivocal. Secondly, uh, civil military relations, the relationship between the military and civilian society and also the relationship between the military and their political leaders. I dined out extensively in the pre-9-11 era on this question of the gap between civilians and the military. And that gap question return, has returned with a vengeance. And I dined out last year all on that same, exact same question, dusting off slides from a decade before. I think that problem has remained uh, despite the 9-11 experience. And, and a third example would be interagency coordination, which uh, was a tremendous problem in the 90s. Uh, and for the last decade, there's been a continuous effort of reforming and improving interagency coordination. And today, people are still saying that system is broken. We need to do a better job. So all of those things that were difficult, I think, have remained difficult. And I'm not sure that we made as much progress on improving them as we would have liked. The last thing that didn't change uh, after 9-11 that I want to mention is the politicization of national security. So yes, there was a very brief political kumbaya moment in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, uh, but it was short-lived, measured in weeks um, um, or maybe months. Uh, and within weeks and months, the Democrats were bashing the Republicans and the Republicans were bashing uh, Democrats on national security, much the way they had been on September 10th. And it's hard to pin down the exact moment when the kumbaya spirit left the, the room, but was it the uh, Democratic armchair general critiquing of the Tora Bora operation, or was it President Bush's um, gotcha switch on the Department of Homeland Security initially opposing it and then um, claiming that it was a, his own idea? Was it the um, critique of the, the 2002 State of the Union, Axis of e what you know as the Axis of Evil speech? Whatever the moment you pick as the time when the kumbaya spirit was lost, it was lost. Uh, that doesn't mean that there was no bipartisanship during the period. Actually, I would argue that there was a remarkable degree of bipartisanship. Uh, I'll just give you one, for instance, uh, there was a long and vigorous debate over the wisdom of confronting Iraq with all sides presenting their case pro and con. And at the end of that long de public debate, the Bush administration won a strong bipartisan vote authorizing the use of force. The vote was 77 to 23 in the Senate and 296 to 113 in the House, which compares quite favorably with the vote on Desert Storm, Desert 
which was the Iraq War of 1990-91, where only uh, – that was a straight party-line vote, 52-47 uh, in the Senate. Uh, and indeed, the lead Democratic presidential candidate uh, in 1990 voted – led the charge against the Iraq War, whereas all of the lead Democratic candidates for president – uh, supported President Bush's um, Iraq policy. At least they did in 2002. So you had some bipartisanship there. You also uh, had large support from the, the congressional leaders on both sides of the aisle for, it was quiet support, but it was um, uh, strong support for what would later become the more controversial elements of the war on terror. So whether it's the terrorist surveillance program, or the Enhanced Interrogation and Rendition Program, so on. Those were all briefed to the congressional leadership. They were all supported, the congressional leadership all supported it, although quietly. So there was some bipartisanship. I don't want to exaggerate the, um, the point, but by 2004, the national security questions about the war on terror were as subject to political debate uh, and as bitterly contested in partisan terms as anything during the Cold War. So we went back to the Cold War experience, which is that politics do not stop at the water's edge, but in fact the parties present competing visions of national security, debate them vigorously uh, during the campaigns, exaggerate the differences during the campaigns, and then maintain a steady, continuous actual policy after the campaign. And in that respect, I would say things didn't change so dramatically. And I'll stop there. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Bruce? The, um, thanks to um, the organizers uh, of these events and the panel for the invitation and for putting all this together. I'm actually reminded um, of, like many Americans, remember your memories of, of, of that day, 9-11-2001. Um, uh, and in the Sanford then Institute now school, you know, I vividly recall, you know, we all got word of what had happened. Uh, and even without Twitter and Facebook, we kind of sent word out around the campus that that afternoon in the Fleischmann Commons, a number of faculty would kind of be on a panel to talk, and the place was packed, and packed, you know, as it often is, to the, to the rafters, basically. And um, uh, I spoke along with some colleagues, and, and we weren't really trying to profess a lot of answers, uh, but we were really trying to help people begin to process and deal with the tragic events. Uh, and I still remember the sort of the shocked and fearful faces, you know, in the room that day. Uh, and I think most profoundly for Americans that day, what that really meant more than I think really anything that had happened before was that the threat was really no longer out there. It was in here. It's true we were attacked in Pearl Harbor. I do not mean to underestimate that. Uh, uh, but that was also... Um, had a military base and in a part of the United States that was not fully a part of the United States at that time. Uh, the White House was burned by the British back in 1814, but um, uh, I don't have any recollections of that. Uh, uh, but this was really a sense of vulnerability. And for, in some respects, I think most profoundly, and in a certain way quite productively, it meant to Americans that we could not, we could debate what kind of foreign policy we have, how we saw the world, but we couldn't go away from it. Right, and you know, when we fought World War World War One and World War Two, we went over there to fight it. We went fought the Vietnam War. We went over there, uh, and so I think that was the sense. And there was no question coming out of that that 9/11 uh, had to be a priority. Uh, and I think much was achieved, uh, more than we probably know, uh, given necessary confidentiality. Uh, we do know certain things, like we did get Osama bin Laden, uh, but the threat remains. Indeed, we saw all these bulletins, you know, yet late last night and during the day, uh, not just from al-Qaeda, but also from affiliates and from offshoots and, and from others. Um, but while acknowledging the threat and the achievements, I think there have been plenty of mistakes that have been made, values that have been violated, and, and other downsides. And other panels have dealt with different issues like uh, civil liberties, uh, Islamophobia, and others raised by 9-11. And our focus here is how we see the world. Uh, so there I want to make three uh, three major critiques. I call them diversion, distortion, uh, and distraction. Uh, diversion, uh, to me, the principal example uh, was very much the Iraq War. Uh, and as someone who'd already written a book uh, a number of years before that about Saddam Hussein, I had no illusions about his brutality and aggressiveness, uh, no tears shed on seeing him go. Uh, but this was a war we didn't have to fight. 
which we fought under deceptive pretenses, and the consequence, consequences of which both international and domestic far outweighed the benefits. Uh, 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 diversion from Afghanistan at a particularly crucial moment uh, was one effect. Uh, the way that it cascaded in terms of how others viewed the United States around the world and how we in turn viewed them, everything from uh, freedom fries as our view of the French, which did remind me in World War I, uh, uh, we renamed sauerkraut liberty cabbage, so we sort of have this thing about, about foods and how they affect our foreign policy. Uh, uh, the three to four million dollar, three to four trillion dollar cost of the war. Uh, uh, and I think Peter cited the votes in the Senate. It's really interesting. I mean, I think that in some respects, it's a longer discussion we get into in the, in the discussion period, you know, but, but in many ways, I think that reflected a couple of things. One, uh, frankly, it reflected for Democrats, of which I've been a part of a long time, this tremendous fear ever since the Viet Vietnam days of being seen as soft on. It used to be soft on communism, and that was soft on terrorism. And after having been attacked, the notion that they would, they would oppose their president, I think, reflected less consensus than concession. Uh, indeed, within the administration itself, there was quite a bit of, of, of differences over that. Uh, and I think in many respects the, the unity at home and other aspects were, were very much a missed opportunity uh, that we can go into, but that takes us away for, from the world. But I think that the notion of diversion and how we saw the world that, that was caused by a number of things, but principally by the Iraq war, uh, was one major factor really affecting us at that time, actually on a continuing basis. Second one that I mentioned is distortion. And here I think it's really affected how we see the Arab world in particular. Uh, and I think we've gotten, uh, 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 we've had a sense of this all along, and I think in the midst of the so-called Arab Spring, uh, there's been even more of this. I've written a couple of articles on this. I wrote an article actually for the last edition of Duke Magazine uh, on U.S. policy and one for um, uh, a policy journal in Washington on, on U.S. policy. Uh, and I think by distortion I mean was it increased our tendency to see this part of the world in very dichotomous black and white terms of, of uh, you know, you're either for us or you're against us, as it was said, uh, and the criteria of being, you know, anti-terrorism. So there's this old expression in American foreign policy that maybe Hal can resolve it. Some people attribute it to FDR and, 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 and Samos in the 1930s, but I've seen others, of, you know, the notion of he may be an SOB, but he's our SOB, uh, which has basically been the notion that they, you know, that they may do things at home, but if they side with us on foreign policy and security issues, that's what's important. You know, in the real world, uh, not all of your friends can be people you absolutely like. Uh, and, I, and, and I think there's, there's always a, a need to work with certain kinds of leaders who we may, may not totally approve of. Uh, but on the other end of the he may be an SOB, but he's our SOB, was the old expression that goes back to John Kennedy of those who make peaceful change impossible make violent revolution inevitable. Uh, and while precise predictions of the Arab Spring could not have been expected, the 9-11 frame distracted attention and distorted assessments as forces of political change built up in one Arab country after another. Uh, the Bush administration engaged in pro-democracy rhetoric, but still largely opted for the anti-terrorism rationale for supporting Arab strongman leaders. And the Obama administration, of which I was a part, stuck with the same rationale too much and for too long, shifting in some cases, but not others, and even then too often hedging uh, in ways that have been tended to be seen as more indecisive than strategic. Uh, and so, during the Cold War, uh, back in um, 1954, uh, when a uh, socialist-leaning, left-leaning leader was elected president of Guatemala, elected president of Guatemala, uh, the CIA undertook an effort to uh, covert action to overthrow him and succeeded. Uh, and when the American ambassador was later testifying to a congressional committee about how do we know he was a communist, he actually said in his testimony, he said, well, senators, um, we have this thing, we call it the duck test. Uh, and if you're looking in a, in a barnyard and you see a bunch of animals uh, and you see one, you're not quite sure it's a duck, but it's hanging around with other ducks or swim with other ducks, then you know it's a duck. Uh, and this was his notion of, of why we should know that our Benz at the time was, um, was, was a, was a uh, red duck. Um, uh, much of that has affected for too long uh, our relations with countries in the Arab world. And indeed, it's been fascinating to see that whether it was Mubarak when he was falling, saying um, uh, it's either me or the terrorists, President Saleh in Yemen saying it's either me or the terrorists, uh, Gaddafi saying me or the terrorists, Assad saying um, uh, it's either me or the terrorists. Uh, 
uh, I think this distortion has put us in a more difficult position, including in this administration, uh, in the way we see the world in the 9-11 frame to deal with forces of change in which we understand that the reality is that political Islam is here to stay in different versions and in different ways in different countries. And that, uh, that our policy has to differentiate between those forms that are genuinely antithetical to our interests and values and those forms that may or may not be our first choice in life, but you can find ways to work with. Uh, indeed, going back to Iraq for a second, um, uh, it would be an interesting thought experiment because uh, it's often argued, well, we did get rid of Saddam Hussein, is to say, okay, if we had not gone to war in Iraq, what would be happening in Iraq today, even if Saddam Hussein had lived and survived amidst the Arab Spring? Would they have been invulnerable to it? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, there's really very few parts of the Arab world that have been. Uh, uh, the political situation in Iraq, I think, is very tenuous uh, in terms of the fundamental conflicts in the society. Uh, and so even if you consider uh, the removal of Saddam Hussein a benefit, it's really interesting to, to question whether or not 10 years later that might have happened anyway uh, without a lot of the costs that, 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 that were there. So. You know, in, in this distorted view, we really have to avoid, as we go forward here, with forces of change that the only thing we know about them is uncertainty. We do not know uh, where Egypt's going to end up, and we do not know where Libya is going to end up. We don't know what's going to happen in Syria next. Uh, but I think to the extent that we fall into the trap of saying, you know, uh, all we want to know is are you, you know, ABT, anything but a terrorist, we're actually more likely to make that outcome likely, as in fact happened a lot in the Cold War uh, in much of the Third World. Uh, that's the uh, diversion and the uh, distortion. The distraction point, we were joking before that we, we, we've done these panels for so long so much that we're actually we're going to switch roles and, and make each other's comments because we kind of know each other's. Uh, but there is this notion of the September 10th agenda. I knew uh, you'd say it. Of course I'd say it. That's right. <laughs> but I know you, even you liked it all these I like years. It. I have to give you that. Right. Um, so when we all went to bed on the night of September 10th, 2011, uh, there were a whole number of issues on the agenda. And caught up in our post-Cold War euphoria, we were not paying a lot of attention to them. I was a senior advisor, foreign policy advisor to Al Gore in 2000 when he was running for president. And neither candidate, neither Gore nor Bush, uh, really paid much attention to foreign policy uh, because our pollster said people didn't care. Uh, but the Middle East peace process after progress in the 90s was falling apart. Uh, genocides and mass killings in places like Bosnia and Rwanda had turned the post-Nazi Holocaust pledge of never again into yet again. China was rising. Putin had come to power in Russia. Uh, the bloom was coming off. The economic globalization rose. Global warming was worsening. I mean, I even recall getting a briefing as a representative Gore during that campaign by a Blue Ribbon Commission on the mounting threat of catastrophic terrorism. And so these issues and more were there when we all went to bed on the night of September 10th. Uh, and again, as I said at the outset, it is understandable that 9-11 became a priority. Uh, but uh, there was a broader transformation going on in the world, uh, and, and we've been distracted from that in many, many profound ways. Uh, the notions of economically in these eastward and south southward shifts in economic dynamism, not that just to China, but generally in those directions to Asia uh, and emerging markets, uh, and the need of what it takes to compete in a global era. Uh, the Middle East peace process uh, is in worse shape, I think, than, than it's ever been. Uh, and in my bipartisan, partially bipartisan way, I think the Obama administration has not been more successful there than the Bush administration was. Uh, global warming is incredibly much worse. Uh, uh, genocides are continuing to happen and on and on. And so we've been distracted from a core set of issues that are a fundamental transformation that the world was going through. Um, I wrote a book last year. Uh, uh, in which we used an, uh, a metaphor from astronomy uh, that we talked about that the transformation of the world was really from the world in the Cold War that was a lot like Ptolemy saw the world, right? And Ptolemy's old, you know, theory of the universe had the Earth at the center and everything revolving around the Earth. And to a great extent in the Cold War era, that's how many people saw the world. The U.S. was at the center. Uh, and we were the wielder of military power, uh, ideological power, economic drive, et cetera, et cetera. But through a variety of forces, we've moved to a Copernican world. Uh, Copernican had this theory, the, Copernicus had this theory of the universe that said every planet has its own orbit. There's something at the center called the sun. And in this 21st century world, we're living in a world where, we're, it, it, where, where it's not so much an aggressive nationalism, but there are more states pursuing their national interests in more ways, I think, than in any other historical period. 
question of what the sun's going to be is the essence of, 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 of questions of cooperation uh, and various aspects of globalization. Uh, uh, I was sort of pleased to see Rick Perry take a shot at this the other night through Galileo, but he didn't, he didn't, he didn't quite <laughs> get, it, get it right. But, but this notion of the Copernican world was, was uh, uh, beginning to develop, and, and the notion that we are no longer at the center of the world, and how do we compete effectively, how do we pursue our interests, how do we provide leadership, uh, is something that it's not that if 9-11 had not happened, we would have gotten right, but the distraction element of 9-11 was, was really an element of that. Um, Anyway, these, these uh, just to do a little plug for our local newspaper, um, Harold Sun is having a commemorative section on 9-11 over the weekend. Some of these ideas that are, are in op-ed I've written for them, so um, you can even have a written version of, a, a, of something that's similar. So, thanks. Thank you, Bruce. Thank, thank you very much, and I'd like to uh, thank Peter and Harold and, and Bruce for allowing me to be part of this very important panel on this of this very important conference, I guess we would call it. Um, I would be, like to begin with a couple of observations. I'm going to talk about some poll, recent poll results and how incongruous they are and what I think they mean for how Americans view the world. And I'd like to make two observations to begin with. Uh, Bruce talked about uh, the memories that a lot of us have about 9-11. And one of the things that has struck me, I'm a relatively new professor here at Duke. I've only been here a year. One of the things that struck me talking to my students is 9-11 is really not in their experience because they were like 8, 9, 10 when 9-11 happened. So their whole world has always been the post-9-11 world. And so I think that when we talk about how do Americans view the world, there's a certain group of Americans who view the world one way, but then there's the upcoming generation that view it another given that they have lived in the, entirely in the post-9-11 world. And I would suggest to you that there are quite a few people around the world who have only lived in the post-9-11 world. I don't have any data to support this, but uh, one of my military friends was telling me that a lot of the Taliban that they're picking up, they never heard of 9-11. They don't know anybody ever attacked the United States. They just assumed the United States was invading Afghanistan to do whatever you know, Westerners do when they invade a, a Middle Eastern or a, a Muslim country. And so I think that it's always good to keep in mind the different perspectives that people bring to these issues. Some of the poll results, and there's, this is, there's been a bunch of polls, as you might imagine, surrounding 9-11, have really kind of been interesting because, as, as one of the analysts put it, they've been in Congress. For example, just on the issue of how Americans view the world, uh, it says that, well, this is an AP poll, just completed in uh, August. While 44% of Americans feel embarrassed by our country's image in the world as a result of the war on terrorism, 40% feel the war on terrorism has helped unite our country. And at the same time, 85% believe that the U.S. efforts to fight the war on terrorism have been at least somewhat effective and that the increased cost has been worth the result in personal safety. In addition, uh, a significant number of Americans, and I'm sure this was addressed by the previous panel, feel that the sacrifice of civil, civil liberties was worth it. But when you start looking at focusing on the external world, you know, it's interesting that pretty significant majorities of Americans today think that the war in Iraq today is not worth it and that the war in Afghanistan is not worth it. And I think that if you really, I would like to see somebody unpack those numbers because I think it has a lot to do with not a resistance to wheel power as Peter might have, Peter suggested, but rather a, a reluctance to spend a lot of money trying to change people's minds about things. In other words, the whole notion of nation building and the very costly aspects of that. Because when you also look at some other polls, there is a fairly hard-minded approach. For example, after uh, Osama bin Laden was captured, there was a poll done on, the, on whether or not torture should be used at least sometimes. What do you think the number 
the percentage of Americans who agreed that torture should be used at least sometimes. What do you think? 70 70%. 60%. 60%. So I don't think that there's a, a reluctance. When you look at these numbers uh, that seem to suggest that Americans don't support the war in Afghanistan or Iraq anymore, it doesn't mean that there's a reluctance to use force or to address terrorism. It's a reluctance to do it in a way that is going to be very costly in blood and treasure. And so that is, I think, one of the reasons why you see more enthusiasm is not the right word, but more uh, energy to use systems like drones and so forth, notwithstanding the fact that I think most Americans are, are aware that the way we do things is not necessarily going to be viewed favorably by the rest of the world. But I think Americans still have a perception that uh, they do things, Americans do things for the right reasons, and that if other people don't like it, they either don't understand it or they're part of the problem. I really believe that that would be one interpretation of the way Americans view the world. It's kind of interesting also to look at some of the other poll results in that something like 58% of Americans think that uh, for other, for people, people's lives have been permanently changed by 9-11. But only 28% think that their personal lives have been changed in some way permanently by 9-11. And I think, I'm not quite sure what that means and how to reconcile that. But there are other things that 39% uh, of Americans say that they would be reluctant to travel abroad because of 9-11. So looking at all this, what I, looking for what I see is, um, is an America that is more inwardly focused, notwithstanding the rise of globalization and everything else, more inwardly focused, wanting to solve problems at home, reluctant to spend a lot of resources to solve problems abroad. There was another poll that was just literally in the last two weeks, and it was the majority of Americans think that something like 25% of the federal budget is, is in foreign aid, and when actually it's 1%, it's something in, in nature of 1%. Now, I will tell you, there will be some people who, who will argue that the $200 billion that we're spending or $100 billion that we're spending each year in Afghanistan is foreign aid and not really uh, producing national security. But the actual foreign aid budget is, is somewhere in, in the order of 1%. But that's the way the, Ameri the typical American sees the world. So as we move forward, I think that we're going to see this more internally focused. I think that um, we're not going to see uh, Americans really uh, looking for opportunities to intervene or become involved elsewhere in the world, even I would submit in circumstances maybe that we might agree we should. I think there is going to be a reluctance to it. I think money is going to play a role. Uh, there's lots of other things that I think are going to affect, um, you know, the worldview. Uh, one of my hobby horses is that, and Hal heard me talk about this yesterday. I think that we're going to have very much of a revolution in world affairs that's going to be driven by um, nanotechnology and robotics that's going to revolutionize. We're going to have hyper-efficient manufacturing. And that is going to change the world a lot because it's going to uh, negate the wage differential that's currently driving manufacturing overseas. And it's going to have an effect on countries that are uh, gaining because of ma manufacturing and so forth. And what that is going to do to the future relationships will be interesting because it's going to allow countries to become more, and help me with the word here, Peter, because you're so much smarter than not, autarkic. Autarkic. Uh, and, and, that, and that's a completely different view than, than what you might, might hear elsewhere. <clears throat> we can, when we get to the um, Q&A, we might want to go into some more detail on civil military relations. Peter alluded to it. Uh, I would suggest that we have a generation of Americans who have served, young people who have served in Iraq and Afghanistan who view the world differently. They've gotten a PhD in how you deal with other cultures. And um, 
not a literal PhD, but a hands-on PhD. And they have a very interesting perspective on the world. And they've brought it back, and we'll see. We'll, we can talk about what we might think that, that will do in the future. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Charlie. Well, we have plenty of time for Q&A. Uh, if you want to ask a question, please catch Ginny's attention, because she's coming around with the mic. Uh, and what do you know, my name is at the top of the list for <laughs> questions. So uh, I want to pick up on a couple of the issues that, that Charlie raised, um, because if you, if you buy that there was a grand strategic transition after 9-11, of some sort or another, as I think pretty much everyone does, then it raises the question of whether we're coming up to another inflection point in American grand strategy. And you can look at this in a couple of ways. There's declining enthusiasm for the type of uh, militarily intensive nation building activities we've been doing over the past 10 years. Uh, there's more and more concern with domestic issues. If you look at polls right now, foreign policy hardly even rates as one of the top issues. So are we, in a sense, uh, I'd be interested to get Peter and Bruce's comments on this, are we approaching another transition point in the way that America looks at the world? Are we going to go back to some of the stuff that was on the September 10th agenda? Are we going to be more inwardly focused? And if so, what is that going to mean for the conflict that we are, to some extent, still waging? Yeah, I, I, would, I would say, in answer to your question and responding to Charlie's talk, that all of the data Charlie cited and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Charlie, that's recent polling data, right? Very recent. Okay, so that, within last that's not days. really a 9-11 effect. That's a post-post-9-11 effect. I'd say that's a post-Iraq and post-economic um, crisis uh, effect. Uh, and it's people forgetting or the memory of 9-11 receding um, in, in their minds. Uh, and I would say that, that it does reflect a, a, a change and and bring raises the question of whether we're going to have a a, strat a debate about grand strategy that's that's even larger than the debate we had after 9/11 because as I indicated, the Bush administration kept all of the other stuff and just added terrorism, but you can't afford that uh, with the budgets that are being contemplated and with the public opinion. Uh, Ref, uh, as reflected in Charlie's numbers, and so there, there you might have to change the grand strategy. It's striking that uh, you know usually a, a presidential election is a time to debate those things, but I don't see yet the um, the foreign policy lines of debate forming. The one candidate on the Republican side, the candidate who might have uh, presented it the most uh, forcefully, ironically, was Tim Pawlenty, who had the most robust of the foreign policy visions um, uh, or the, uh, on the Republican side, and he's no longer in. And, and whether it's Romney or, or uh, Perry, the two current front runners, they both have a strong critique of Obama uh, and identify many, many, many ways in which they disagree with his argument. But they both also seem to have uh, gestured in the direction of the kind of retrenchment that Charlie was talking about and that President Obama himself has, uh, has seemed to embrace. So, mm -hmm. so I, I'm not sure that you'll see a partisan debate. Uh, there's still time for that to form, so I don't want to be locked in uh, to, to that prediction. And, and incidents can change the world very, very right. rapidly. Well, that, 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 and that allows me to make my, my other, one other point. Perhaps from a foreign policy point of view and from the way that America looks at the world point of view, the most important thing that's happened since 9-11 is something that didn't happen. There wasn't a follow-on mass casualty attack. Uh, if there was a follow-on mass casualty attack, uh, then I think that the uh, not only would our the morning's panels be totally different, talking about human rights law and, and treatment of um, uh, of American Muslims, but I think America's the our willingness to wield power abroad would be very very different. Uh, if there was another mass casualty attack. And I think that is always a possibility. And if that happens, we should reconvene uh, and discuss this again. Yeah, a couple of points along these lines. I mean, one I think is this inward turn. I think I'd be surprised if we weren't doing that, given the domestic problems that we face. I mean, you know, the whole, you know, the, the numbers are staggering on, on jobs and unemployment, long-term unemployed. And when you realize that, 
that jobs for many people, you know, really it's not just their income, it's their identity. And so of course we really need to, to pay attention to these aspects. Uh, and in some respects, I agree with Charlie, it's, it's, it's provided a little bit of political safe ground for, certain, for political leaders to say, for the first time in a long time, we really need to cut the defense budget in significant ways. And I'm not saying that's a good idea or a bad idea, but the whole notion that, that was put on the table in these debt ceiling things uh, allowed some people to say, you know, who may have been wanting to do that for a long time anyway, you know, I'd really like to keep spending this money, but we can't afford it anymore. It's the first time we've been able to have that argument out there. And again, I don't know whether that's a good or a bad thing, but I think that reflects the situation. But two other parts of that. One is, um, I think people fundamentally understand, and the polls will always fluctuate. You know, you catch somebody in a mood, you know, when something happens and you get one reading. So you have to kind of look at these over time. And we have not seen a major movement in the so-called internationalist isolationist polls. Uh, at a fundamental level, people understand that we can't solve our problems on our own, uh, that, you know, our international financial system, we may be causing more problems for the world than they're causing us, but the question of, you know, where we sit, when Ben Bernanke sets interest rates, he's got his eye on, on global markets, not just American. Uh, uh, when, it, when we think about where uh, we're going to be creating jobs, some of it is going to be infrastructure, some of it's going to be export-oriented. Uh, if you care about global warming, if you care about, you know, global public, public health and the possibility of pandemics. So at a fundamental gut level, I think people know that we can't turn inward too much. But I think they're beginning to understand, uh, and again, I think we, we've missed out a lot on this, is that power and influence in today's world is a lot about strength from within, not just influence without. Who is competitive in international uh, uh, industries? And so you've seen a shift, for example, in China, not just to low-wage labor, India to call centers, but to Microsoft and others setting up fundamental research parks, you know, innovative technologies going on there. And what we need to do is we need strength from within. We need to reduce our vulnerabilities. Uh, we know that oil supplies are going to be unstable. I mean, that's a reality. You know, OPEC countries, other countries like Russia, Venezuela. So what do you do? Well, it might make sense if we, um, uh, as President Bush once said, reduced our addiction to oil you know, reduced our vulnerabilities. So, so some of that is domestic, and it needs to be done in a way that's not neo-mercantilist or externalizing your costs. But to the extent we have a domestic focus, that can actually help our global role. It can help us compete and play a role. On the election, um, I think that it reminds me, you know, there are very few elections that have been issue-specific. I think 2004, 9-11 was a very big part of it. I think 1972, Vietnam was, 1980, uh, the mix of the Iranian hostages and the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. In 2000, along my remarks before, is foreign policy was not a big issue, but when people were polled about what mattered to them, they kept saying leadership. And when they're asked the follow-up question, how you measured leadership, they said America's global role. Uh, and, and in that sense, foreign policy played in. I mean, I actually think coming from Vice President Gore's point of view, I think it was, it was, it was a strength that we didn't effectively develop. Uh, I think this one's going to be a little bit like that as well. For all the focus on the economy, people are looking for leadership, for decisiveness, which is going to be a criteria for President Obama. And if you're in a close election and your issue only matters for one or two percent and the economy matters for a bigger picture, it still matters a lot. So in that sense, I think if, if something big happens, we'll have an issue. But I, I think foreign policy is going to play in in this notion of we need a strong, decisive leader, uh, even if you leave aside China bashing and other sorts of things. And, and so in that sense, it will be part of the political mix uh, for a small percentage, but it could be a decisive percentage. Thank you. Yes, sir. I had a question for Professor Fever. Um, if you, you mentioned two of the pillars were uh, making people more like us from a de democratic standpoint and then more like us economically. Um, Given how democracy, we've tried to institute that in some countries, it's been met with mixed results, I would say, uh, in some of them. Is it more important for us to and focus more resources on exporting, in a sense, the market-driven view or the make the economies more like us or the democracy piece? I think both of those uh, took a, a, a real, uh, the, the credibility or the attractiveness of both of those aspects of the model uh, took a real blow, the democracy piece with the difficulties in Iraq and Afghanistan, but the economic piece with the, the economic crisis of 08-09. Uh, 
where the, the so-called Washington consensus model was called into question and, and indeed was blamed for the, the, the crisis. Um, so I, I would say that both were, both were challenged and yet both are, uh, predate George Bush for sure. I mean, there it's the, the quintessence of the Clinton national security strategy, but it predates the, that as well. That was, that's really what America's been about for several hundred years is the belief that our model is, is the one that most people would choose if they were free to choose. And if they pursued it, everyone will benefit and will benefit the most. Uh, so I think we will get, uh, get back to that. Um, the one foreign policy issue that, that you might see uh, reemerging um, is, uh, in this regard, is the question of free trade. So President Obama attempted to revive that uh, in a partisan way in this just this past week, sort of calling on the Republicans to get off their duff and finally vote for uh, the bill. Uh, the, the, his attack didn't have quite the cachet it might have because they forgot that they hadn't submitted the bill yet. Uh, so that was, a, that was a slight problem in terms of the delivery of the punch. Uh, but there's no question that, uh, that people will be looking for ways in, in which to make foreign policy a job creator rather than a job killer. The problem is, when it comes to foreign uh, trade, that there's a disagreement that does uh, split the parties on whether foreign trade creates or, or loses jobs. And there's a wing of the Democratic base that says it lo it's a job loser, job killer, we can't afford it. And I think that's part of the reason why the trade agenda has stalled under, under President Obama. Uh, and then your question is, which one is more important? I think President Clinton had it right, that you can't separate one from the other, that, they, that the two of them work in tandem, and that uh, democracies that don't have robust economies don't last as democracies very long, but also countries that try to have a robust economy while suppressing their uh, people's desire for political freedom uh, find that that's an unsustainable um, equilibrium as well, and that's China or whatever. So I would say you can't emphasize one without the other. If, if I could dive in there, I, I really do agree with you, Peter, because one of the things that we found out, particularly people in the military, is it's almost a Huntington view of the world that there, there are other societies that think very, very differently than we do and have a different value set. For example, talking about democracy, the idea in another culture, what do you mean I'm not going to have my grandfather as my leader? How would, how would that be? You know, they, they can't even conceive of a true democracy. Or, um, or a free enterprise. What do you mean I'm not, you're not, I'm not going to give my brother this contract? I know my brother. He'll, he'll get it done. What do you mean I have to let that other tribe bid on it? You know, it, it's not even getting there. But I will tell you one thing that I think is going to change. It's the young people and it's the access to information. You know, there are places in Afghanistan today that have cell phones that never had, you know, five years ago, they wouldn't even know what was in the next valley. But now they're talking to people all over the world and the internet and so forth. And I really do think that once people see the way the rest of the world works, and especially in a period of transition in both Iraq and Afghanistan and other places in the world, that that information is going to have is going to make changes. Whether we like all the changes is still the jury's out on that. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. My question, General, you alluded to nanotechnology as one of the ways by which we would lead our country. And I, I recognize that some of our manufacturing is coming back, but would you be more erudite on that particular point and where you see uh, nanotechnology being one of the big leaders in our efforts? If, if I were more erudite, I, I would be, believe me. <laughs> but here's what I think. I think the rise in robotics, there's lots of reasons why robotics, a lot of money is going into robotics, one of which is in manufacturing. And to the extent that wages are the differential, I think that advanced robotics are going to narrow that differential. And a lot of that has to do with fine work that can be done with I mean, physically getting something that can, that can do it. And I think that advances in nanotechnology and so forth are going to do that. So then you're left with the cost of goods, moving goods to the marketplace, 
which if the factories in downtown Durham, then that's going to be minimal. And then the cost of materials and getting materials, which I think in the future really is going to be the source of conflict. That's why it's somewhat of a shame. It's a shame, I think, that when you talk about grand strategies, you know, Africa is almost never mentioned in there, even though Africa is a great source of, of materials. The Chinese certainly have seen it that way. And they're getting very, very aggressive in Africa, but it doesn't seem to be on the radar scope anywhere in our country. Um, hello? My wife said I should never be given a microphone, but this is it. Um, like Charlie, I'm a fan of polls. And I'm just going to mention a poll taken in 1970, 41 years ago. Um, this was three years after the Summer of Love, three years after the March in the Pentagon, a year after Woodstock. So some of the younger people, the majority of this audience, probably all oh, the country has been, the, our agenda has been driven by a bunch of woolly-headed bomb throwers. Well, there's a poll on Kent State where the four were killed. The majority of adults in the U.S. said they did the right thing. And who did that? To have live at the, the National Guard who shot those students that was necessary because they had burned that ROTC building two nights before. You know, <laughs> as we get further away from these horrific events, we say, oh yeah, that was, we were a very liberal country then. We certainly weren't if, but anyway, enough about that. I wanted to mention, I think Bruce brought it up, about 85% feel we have effective measures. About, I was listening to NPR uh, about 2005, 2006, and I had a bunch of a group of uh, retired CIA and FBI people on there. And they said if a credible report came in from the street to an agent, how many levels would it have to go up to it was acted upon? They said 85. This was five years after 9-11. At that time, my brother-in-law was with the FBI. And I mentioned to him, he laughed. He said, are you kidding? It's at least 100. So I don't know if it's fair to ask anyone on the panel, did they, hopefully you have some better information that if a credible report comes in about some terrorist act or some plot brewing, that it doesn't take that long to, through emails and phone calls to get up to that level. So. Well, it, I think this has probably been a subject of a, one of the other panels, but there has been a great effort in government to tear down walls to facilitate the exchange of information. And to most people would say that that was a unqualified good. I'm not so sure that it is an unqualified good, which is kind of interesting when you look at these polls that a substantial number of Americans, something in excess of 40 percent, think it's okay for the government to read their emails without a warrant. And a, it's, they, there's a slight edge to the civil liberties over security, but there's a, there's a number of things that, that are troubling. But what is subject to this panel as we look outwards, I think one of the, the great challenges that we're going to have with other countries is our inability to keep things secret. And that is going to, that is going to affect our relationships with other countries in a, in a real way. And how that plays out in the future, I'm not quite sure, but it's, that is going to complicate, I think, our grand strategy or however you want to put it, our, our diplomacy, certainly. And even our relationship with our military, mill-to-mill mil -mil relationships, I think, is going to be complicated. Now, having said all that, I've often thought that, I've often, I, I believe that if you create something electronically, it is compromised, period. So you might as well start living in a world where you assume that if it's electronically in existence, it is compromised, it is in the hands of the person you least want to have it. Therefore, start planning your strategy, be it military, political, or whatever, based on that assumption. General Gray, who's coming down to the Marine Corps, used to say <clears throat> when a lot of things about <clears throat> the information revolution, he said, you know, when you play chess, you can see exactly where the other guy is at, and it doesn't mean you win all the time. So it may be that we have to rethink how we approach our diplomacy, our military strategy, and so forth, based on the idea that everybody's going to know everything about 
I think the big thing in the future is going to be authenticity of information. You know, because now you can make things look pretty darn convincing uh, without too much trouble. And when you get the smart guys trying to make something look look like something, other smart guys can't tell the difference. So it's a that's a, just an observation. It's a, just one point on a, a thing. One of the points you brought up is this whole balance between national security and civil liberties. Historically, has been very difficult for us. Okay, not just now, but you know, historically, we had periods where it would get difficult during a war that had a beginning and an end. World War One, World War Two, uh, but even then, you know, 1942, you had the internment of Japanese Americans. Now, I used to teach at the University of California, live out in California, and I was asked once by a friend who was a Methodist minister who had a congregation out in the foothills of the Sierras to come out on a Sunday and just have a conversation about world affairs with his congregants. This was in the early to mid-80s. Many of them were people, Japanese Americans, who had been interned. Uh, and uh, why were they interned? For the barest of suspicions that had to do with their race and ethnicity, that they would be spies. Uh, so we have wrestled with this a lot. I think the difference we saw in the Cold War, McCarthyism during the Vietnam period, happened to have a college roommate uh, in 1970 who went to high school with one of the girls who was shot at Kent State. So for him, it was really quite, quite personal. Um, you know, during the Cold War, we had an open-ended period where we had to re wrestle with the balance between national security and civil liberties, freedom of the press, could the New York Times print the Pentagon Papers, uh, the McCarthy period. Yeah, there was some spying going on in the United States, but the notion that McCarthy could ride roughshod you know, over the American military, other political leaders, and, and all sorts of citizens. And I think that's one of the issues now for us in this notion of, you know, the terrorism threat is not going to go away. You know, I think that we can count, as a good friend of mine who's been very involved in this uh, with the uh, 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 agency, the CIA, number of people they've taken off the battlefield. This is a conversation we had even before, about four days before bin Laden. Um, uh, we can count those, but I think the threat's always going to be there, whether it's, you know, like we saw in Norway or, we, we, you know, we saw in Oklahoma City or it's going to be, you know, various versions of various forms of terrorism, the super-empowered individuals. So one of the issues for us as a country, two of them, one is how do we maintain this balance between national security and civil liberty so it doesn't go up and down that we find, uh, you know, we get a comfortable point that understands the importance of civil liberties when we're not feeling threatened, but right after a threat or after a terrible thing, you know, we justify everything. And a lot of people in this business talk about resilience. We really need resilience as a culture. If something bad happens again, and we'll do everything we can to prevent it. And I agree with the point Charlie made. I think we've made a lot of progress on this. But, you know, it's never going to be perfect in terms of uh, agencies and individuals working together. But we need resilience after this to, to not underreact, but also not overreact. And frankly, I worry a lot about that uh, in our political you know, overheated environment, uh, and just what our historical patterns are as a culture. I mean, Bin Laden often, you know, said that, you know, part of his strategy was to do something in the United States to which he knew they would overreact. Not that he predicted Iraq or other things. They would expend a lot of their resources, et cetera. You know, and so I think we have to get a handle on that as a culture. It's a very difficult thing to do. You can't go out there as a leader running for president and say, look, next time the next incident happens, we have to manage our reaction. You know, forget about it. But that resilience question has to be given a lot of serious consideration at every level, political leaders, uh, uh, people in our culture, people in our communication systems as well. I, I hope folks took a note on really listen to what Bruce said because I think it is the issue of our day, what, is, what we are going to do when the next incident happens. Most Americans, by the way, the polls show, believe that there is going to be another incident. But what's interesting when we talked about uh, uh, detention, 50% of Americans in these recent polls believe it is okay to uh, detain people without charges and trial if they're foreigners. If they're Americans, only 34% percent believe that they should be detained without charges and, and um, trial. You know, it is interesting when you start thinking about it. We have spent a, a more than a trillion dollars to address a threat that resulted in the deaths of 3,000 Americans. We have not spent a trillion dollars, as David Chancer and, and his folks have, to address 
the 100,000 Americans who have been killed by non-state actors since 9-11 in murders. And we haven't spent a trillion dollars to address the 350,000 Americans who have been killed since 9-11 in automobile accidents. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and for example, in Afghanistan now, uh, George Will had a column recently where he ran the numbers. He said, you know, David Petraeus tells us there's 50 to 100 al-Qaeda left, and so we're spending one to $1.5 billion per al-Qaeda. Now, if, you know, we, we, so Bruce, I do think that we ought to have defense spending as part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, and we ought to have some, some hard discussions as we look forward as to what really constitutes existential threats and what constitutes serious threats and what constitutes, gee, we'd like to do that. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a great difference and I think the American people are prepared for it, although I will say one rather parochial thing. I think that some politicians are going to find a third rail uh, in the defense discussion when they start cutting, uh, talking about cutting benefits for serving soldiers. I, I, <clears throat> I don't think the American people are going to stand up for that. I don't, they won't care how much money it seems to say say they're not, that will become the third rail of the defense discussion. What, what so about uh, retirement benefits for washed up two stars? Would they, <laughs> would they cut that to save the... Well, quite honestly, <laughs> um, you know, uh, if they want to, you know, take a shot at that, I'm... I'm not <laughs> Just bring it on. Is that Good American. That's it. Yes, in the blue. Uh, my question is for Professor Fever. I'd like you to comment on... Um, the recent report that the Obama, Obama administration wants to draw down troops in Iraq to, to about 3,000. And particularly for our conversation, what, what do you think will be the impact of the American public, uh, their views on the situation now in Iraq, if those levels are drawn down to 3,000? And what do you think the goals of the Obama administration are for that drawdown? Uh, that, those, that's an important series of questions. I think answering them in reverse order, the goals, the Obama administration's goals is a campaign talking point to say that they ended the war in Iraq. Um, and uh, they want to be able to say that and they, they want to get, therefore, the number of troops as low as possible to make the notion that the war has ended a plausible one. Um, the, the number that they've come at is uh, is lower than the number that the um, that at least reportedly that that the generals on the ground say they need, and uh, it, the the low number that they the generals offered was ten thousand, which they said they could do in extremis, uh, and so three to four uh, is very low. It's lower also than what uh, apparently Secretary Clinton argued for, and in a sense. She has more at stake even than the Pentagon because uh, the the vast the, there'll be a high number of State Department um, officials still in Iraq and they will they do not have organic security the way a, a military unit would they have to either get security from the U S military but if the U S military is not there then from contractors who are extremely expensive and of course the State Department budget can't afford th the that expense and so. Uh, I can understand why she thought the number, she wanted a higher rather than a, a lower number. But I don't know what the uh, correct number is. It seems to me that the administration has approached it the wrong way by focusing on the number rather than focusing on the mission, and indeed has not uh, worked the Maliki file as, uh, as vigorously as they needed to. Maliki, the prime minister of, uh, of Iraq, we can't have, under Iraqi law, we can't have any troops staying, mm -hmm. uh, or any, any combat troops, I should say, staying after um, the end of the year. Uh, and the plan all along was to, for, to renegotiate an agreement with Maliki that would get that, uh, a new agreement which would allow for some number uh, to stay under, under provisions that were mutually agreed upon. And the administration did not push uh, very hard, they would say, course they're here they'd say they pushed very very hard they put their best man on the job vice president biden uh, and you would I, my question would be how often did president obama talk to prime minister maliki about this because the previous agreements were gotten out of uh, 
extensive uh, bilateral person-to-person -person personal diplomacy. And the, my read of it, uh, and Bruce, of course, is much better connected than I am, my read of it is that, that President Obama is not as invested in that relationship or even in the Iraq mission, and so let, let that ball drop. And so now we're in a, a, a situation where there's not enough time, perhaps, to negotiate an adequate agreement, and even the numbers that are being talked about are being talked about in a sort of um, last-minute panic way rather than in a due, deliberate, sort of responsible planning way. So I worry, I worry about it. Uh, and it may work out. Uh, it, it may be that the, that the Iraqi security forces are capable of doing more than, than we think that they can do, and maybe that you don't need the U.S. troops, but that strikes me as a very risky gamble. And if I were advising President Obama, I would tell him that the political sting has gone out of the Iraq issue, so that 10,000 troops, whatever, would not be a huge campaign issue. Uh, the Republicans wouldn't be bashing him for it. So there's not the political gain from doing a more prudent course of action in Iraq, I think, uh, is, or, or at least the political cost of doing a more prudent course would be minimal or maybe even zero. So that would be my, my take on it. But I'd be curious for Bruce's take, because he has better sources than I do. Um, you know, I, I didn't work on the Iraq issue when I was in the administration. Um, worked on easy things like uh, Israeli-Palestinian peace. Um, <laughs> was that what others. you said wasn't working well? I did say that wasn't working well. <laughs> okay. Well, so of course it means they didn't take any of my advice, right? Yeah. So it was lose, lose. Um, you know, I would not attribute it all to, to political calculations. I mean, there is... Look, you know, Iraq had an election which was heralded and it took them over a year to form a government. Uh, and then the government keeps falling apart. Uh, there is an analysis and an argument that says that, that the core provision of security by the Iraqis for themselves uh, is not going to be enhanced whether we stay one, two, three, five more years with four, six, ten thousand troops. That fundamentally they just have to do reconciliation among themselves uh, and that, uh, that our presence may actually not help that. Okay, and I think there's some people that take that view. I can't speak for the president how it all adds up. You get advice from a lot of things, but I, I don't think that it's not being committed to the mission. Uh, but I think it's a fundamental question after all these years and, and, and sort of the um, uh, decent interval, if you will, that the surge provided, uh, that it's a political question. And, um, uh, and that they're not making progress. Would more calls from President Obama and Maliki change? No, I'm not so sure. You know, Maliki has his own agenda. Uh, you know, he's been meeting with, you know, all sorts of leaders in the region because he has his own national interests. So, so that's my sense of that. And that relates to sort of, I think, to Charlie's point about the whole, you know, scope and limits of nation building. Uh, it's a very, very difficult mission. You know, uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan are, are, are examples. There are plenty of other examples out there. So I, I wouldn't attribute all the politics. And if you disagree with the argument, I'm, one might disagree with the argument I'm making, but I think it's supposed to be treated as a strategic argument, not just politics versus, you know, strategic argument. Yeah, I, I think the American people, 3,000, 10,000, it's not going to be an issue. I, I agree with you, uh, Peter, that 10,000 would be more prudent just to ensure the security of our State Department people there. 10,000 troops in that large a country are, is really not very many troops. But I think that the American people, they'd be happy with zero because I think they have been affected over time by what is what they perceive to be the sheer ingratitude of the Iraqi people. You know, here we spent all this blood and treasure to free them from Saddam Hussein. And, and remember, we thought that they would be grateful for it. And in fact, they aren't. They are, they are, they're glad to be free from Saddam Hussein, but they don't really attribute that to us. There was a poll done. You can see I'm kind of a poll guy. After the surge, and only 4% of Iraqis believe that U.S. troops and the actions that U.S. troops did in 2007 played a role in suppressing the violence, which was the big year that the violence was suppressed. You know, we know that's not true, but the fact is that that's the way they perceive it. And there's all kinds of deep cultural reasons why, you know, they're not going to be able to say that Americans did something good in Iraq. But I think it has an effect on the American people. So I think Iraq will absent some kind of explosion there, 
uh, I don't think it's going to be a non-issue. And I don't think that the administration is acting politically. I don't think the Republicans are acting politically vis-a-vis -vis Iraq. I think everybody's looking for, you know, the right way out. Yeah. Seth. Hi. Um, so I'm interested in whether the fact that we haven't had an attack, a mass casualty attack since 9-11, does that tell us anything at all about whether we may or may not have overreached in our response to 9-11? The reason I'm wondering is that in the aftermath of 9-11, almost everybody seemed to think that that was the beginning of what would, would likely be a series of attacks, or at least that there would be follow-on attacks. When I'm thinking of the example of kind of the clearest example of overreach, I think many people would argue, and probably one of them, that it was the Iraq war. But if you play out the counterfactual, if we hadn't gone to Iraq, then there wouldn't have been you know, thousands and thousands of US targets in the Middle East. And I wonder if, if maybe energy directed against them there would have more likely been directed against us here. So I'm wondering if the absence of an attack tells us anything at all about about that. I mean, I, we can pass that around. I, you know, it, as you said, Seth, it's the counterfactual. You can't, it's like anything about prevention, right? So preventive medicine, if I take my Crestor, you know, my, uh, you know, um, statin, and I don't have a heart attack, would I have had one in an earlier age? You, you can't know. It's the great dilemma of prevention as a strategy. You know, uh, you know, would Gaddafi really have slaughtered people at Benghazi? Well, we have some fairly strong basis for thinking he would have, but we can't know for sure. Um, my argument, you know, along with this sort of diversion, distraction, distortion, would be um, we really do have to give a lot of credit for, for, for preventing an attack, whether it's specific incidents in both administrations or it's the deterrent effect that knowing that America is more prepared and so, you know, some that might try an attack didn't. Uh, we've got to give a lot of credit for that, but I think we could have done that without, as you put it, over, overreacting. And I think that we could have had you know, nothing's perfect and e evenly balanced, but we could have ensured and we needed to ensure, and, and despite what we were saying before, we need to really minimize the possibility of attacks. We've got to understand it may not be zero. Uh, but at the same time, criticizing all these other aspects. It's not a two-choice world, either the policy we had or some notion of saying that 9-11 that didn't matter. Uh, so, uh, you know, where that balance point is between the absolutely perfect <laughs> reaction without Monday morning quarterbacking in our reaction, it's hard to say, but I think I think for me at least, there's a lot on the on the on the misreacting and overreacting side. I, I think you're on to, to something important, and I'll speak first since I'm going to take a cheap shot at you, Charlie, to give you a chance to retaliate. But because if you don't ask that question and don't do the serious counterfactual that's implied by that, so we're not in Iraq. What does the world really look like? Uh, as you say, there's a lot of Al Qaeda diversion available to the United States. By the way, there. Um, they will not have killed as many Muslims themselves, so their narrative won't be as discredited as it is. Iraq discredited their narrative arguably as much or more than it discredited the, uh, the Western narrative. So there's, when, once you do a more serious look at the counterfactuals, you might come to a different conclusion. But there's the other piece of it that's so important. It's the fallacy of, of it didn't happen. So Charlie's point about, uh, about highway deaths. Charlie's forgetting the hundreds of billions, probably trillions of dollars that are spent building safe highways and a coercive state apparatus that prevents my 13-year-old daughter from driving uh, and requires a card, an actual card, an identity card to drive the car, which is so un-American when you think about it, and yet we do that so as to prevent highway deaths and so forth. So actually, the U.S. spends an enormous amount of effort to prevent highway deaths, and we still have a lot of highway deaths. We could do more, you're saying, but we did. We do a lot to prevent it. We do a lot to prevent the, the ter a second terrorist attack, and we know for a fact that a number of terrorist attacks were attempted and interrupted at various stages of completion, so it's highly likely that if we hadn't been doing those things, they would have been, they, they would have been successful on the terrorist terms and Americans would have died. So I, I think that's probably the hardest part of the assessing the utility of the war on terrorism because how do you value the lives of the Americans and the, and the, the economic um, uh, production that was preserved because things 
didn't happen. And I would say that uh, it's likely that the balance sheet is, 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 looks a little more favorable than, than Charlie's description. So Charlie, well, last I, word. I think it's an apples and orange comparison because you're not taking into account, Peter, that for every person killed in 9-11, there were two American servicemen killed and there were 15 that were injured for every person. So, so that we have not devoted the kind of resources towards these larger, you know, 100,000 murders and so forth. And I would suggest that if there was a terrorist incident that killed 100,000 people, you, you, would, you would see all kinds of uh, things happen. But getting back to your question, that is a big question, particularly in the cyber world. You know, everybody says, oh, some kid in, in his garage can figure out a way to bring down the grid. Let me tell you something. There are people out there who are disposed to do that if they could do it. And guess what? It's a lot harder. Uh, so I think there's a lot of puffery on this cyber war threat. But getting back to specifically, I, I think if we hadn't done either, either Afghanistan or Iraq, we would have had another attack. What Afghanistan or Iraq, yeah, I'm not so sure that we needed to do Iraq, but, but Afghanistan we needed to do because there are a lot of people who saw what B-52s do, and there are a lot of countries that would be disposed in one way or another to facilitate terrorists that suddenly they didn't want to have anything to do with them. You know, it didn't mean that they disappeared, but it vastly complicated the ability to strike here because it's, it's more complicated than people think. And all the little things that were done in the post 9-11 world injected what Clausewitz would call friction into the process. And I would suggest to you that there are uh, nations in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, for example, remember most what, 17 of the 19 came from Saudi Arabia? Saudi Arabians, the, the king did a lot of things internally. Some good, some who knows. Uh, so I do think that at least Afghanistan was a message to those who would be disposed to support those who would attack us. And I think even in Afghanistan today, if the Taliban took over, they wouldn't be anxious to have any Arab al-Qaeda in their midst in the same way they were before because they know how hot that stove can be. Um, who knows what the future, I disagree a little bit with Bruce in that if we hadn't invaded Iraq, Saddam would have fallen in the Arab Spring. I think we would have had Syria on steroids because however, <coughs> You know, we think the Syrians have a tough internal security and, and an army and so forth. I think Saddam would have been vastly more brutal, and uh, it would have been a true bloodbath. And <clears throat> and there were, you know, the Kurds gave it a pretty good shot a number of times, and the Shias gave it a pretty good shot a number of times. And it, it, I think Saddam would have been the last standing dictator in the Middle East. Yeah, you just took a comment. I, I was raising that as, as, as a question, not saying it absolutely would have happened, but it is a way along the notion of what my colleague Peter called serious counterfactuals, because I think from my perspective, if you're going to calculate what would have happened if we didn't invade Iraq, you also have the incredible recruiting value for al-Qaeda that the Iraq invasion had. Uh, you had the distraction from Afghanistan at a point where we actually could have won this as almost a quasi semi-conventional war, a little bit unconventional. Uh, so there's a number of things to run your counterfactuals, I think, and, and uh, I think we each have our own views on that, but, it, but, it, but it's you know, an open question. Uh, and, um, uh, and the Arab Spring was more the notion, if you take 10 years, what I see is net negative from that, what might have come out the other end? And I, I have no idea. I mean, you know, we could well have seen you know, an Assad-like uh, response uh, we might have seen a different reaction in the international community, you know, some, somewhere between Gaddafi, where the Arab League and the GCC got behind it, and, and Assad, where they're not willing to, given Saddam's history with, with some of his fellow Arab countries. We just don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have time for one more question and some brief answers. Uh, so as you pointed out earlier, of course, the most crucial thing for uh, the U.S. is to prevent another 9-11. Uh, but then taking into account that, at least in part, I suppose, that uh, sort of the reason for why there hasn't been another 9-11 is because, or another terrorist attack has been that um, 
Al Qaeda and other organizations have then sort of sought out these large, these grand schemes of terrorism in order to, in order to try to make something worse than 9 11. Um, how would America prepare itself if this sort of this mentality uh, of planning terrorist attacks would change to a more grassroots level or where these targets would be way smaller? Or if, for example, as we saw in Norway, as opposed to organizations being behind these things, there would just be rogue individuals that sort of would be, I would suppose, very hard to track down and track down any communications and so, stuff like that. How would you prepare for that? Well, I, I, think, I think you've hit on exactly the reason why terrorism is going to be with us ad infinitum. I think it's going to get, because, you know, the concept of operations has changed. It's not the, the central organized. It's, I think the IRA called leaderless resistant. You have these isolated cells that don't know each other, and they're very, very hard to dig out. And so I think you're always going to have the rogue individual, and you're going to have other individuals who are going to be hard to disassemble and doing the small act. Get, buying a gun and coming in and, and blowing away 10 people is a doable proposition. And the reason is, and this is where I might debate your, your first statement, that the most important thing is to avoid another 9-11. We are not there in this country. And I would suggest that, do we really want to be there? Because what it would take to be absolutely certain we would never have another 9-11 would really be a police state. And, um, and I think Americans throughout our history, we've always traded liberty for security, you know, traded security for liberty. You know, we've always, we've, you know, if, if it wasn't that way, we wouldn't have the Second Amendment for one thing. We want, like most countries in the world, you can't own, two, you, you wouldn't have 200 million weapons in the hands of private individuals as we have in this country. But it's, it's the way it, we are a risk-taking society. And we, from time to time, we are going to pay a horrible price for that. But on balance, we have to remember what we gain from the kind of society we have. Because guess what? Bill Gates doesn't grow up in a totalitarian society. That, you, have to, you have to be in a society where you can free think, where you can do goofy stuff, where you can say things that 20 years later, you wish you hadn't put on your Facebook. Yeah, but, but, you know, you have to have that kind of free thinking to have the entrepreneurial spirit that builds the free enterprise system that makes this nation as strong as it is. And once you crush that, then you crush, you ultimately crush your security. So you see how, how it works around. And so I'm here to tell you, we need to prepare. And Bruce, Bruce made this point, I think, very eloquently. We need to prepare for the next incident. And here's what I think is important for students at Duke University to think about. You have to sit there and think, when it happens, you need to be the voice of reason. You need to be the voice of reason because you need to sit down and think about it in advance. Because when that happens, there are people under stress do crazy stuff. You have people saying, let's bring everybody in that doesn't look like us and waterboard them, and maybe they know something. Or some, somebody's watching a video, a predator video, and say, hey, you know, that guy's tall. He sort of looks like Osama bin, let's kill him, and maybe it is him. You know, that's the kind of crazy stuff that can happen. So that's what you need to prepare yourself for that day. You know, Winston Churchill says, in every person's life, there comes an opportunity to do something great. <clears throat> and it's a shame if they're not prepared when that opportunity reaches them. And that's why it's so important to, to come to things like this, educate yourself, and think about that moment when you are going to be called upon to do the right thing. Yeah, I just want to agree with what he said. I think we need to prepare, we need to prevent, and we need to be, we need to be resilient when things happen, because they're going to happen. I would not say the most important foreign policy objective is to pre prevent another 9-11. I would say it's to prevent one that was, you know, a 9-11 with WMD, okay, because that we're talking much, much more dramatic. I, you know, I think, I mean, again, not that other countries are perfect or better than us, you know, but the British endured, you know, all of World War II, you know, and the bombings that they endured. 
Uh, and then they endured the IRA. I was in graduate school in London when the IRA in the mid '70s was was you know was bombing Harrods and stuff. And they didn't just you know wipe it off, but they went on with their lives and they dealt with it. And you know uh, and, you know on a continuing basis, we need to figure out how to deal with these kinds of issues because they may not come from Al Qaeda. They may come from a guy like like in Norway. It's the super empowered individual. Uh, it may be you know cyber. It may be this. So we really have to think about avoiding the overreaction. Uh, as well as strategies for preparing, because I really do worry about the fabric of our society and our system uh, from from people being, you know, overreacting and being rabble roused into into fear and anger and and hatred. Two quick things: the if I I may have misspoke when I said there wasn't another attack after 9/11. There were many attacks. They haven't been on U.S. soil, however, and that's an important uh, caveat. Uh, the second thing is the answer to your question will be worked out by the political process. The American people that weigh different risks differently. And there's, a, there's actually been polling, I'm surprised you didn't cite, cite this, Charlie, that when they interviewed people, what, what risks are you willing to tolerate? What risks are you, would you punish if they happen? And it turns out that the Americans say that they'll punish political leaders for another terrorist attack more than they punish leaders for the level of uh, highway deaths and so forth. That the that their the political process works out what the American people say, the risks they're willing to run on the highways, the risks they're willing to run in terms of uh, preventable medical care and so forth. Uh, and the process, uh, to me, the great success of the last uh, decade has been that the political process survived the 9/11 experience. And there was a vigorous political debate very quickly afterwards, different viewpoints uh, taken, and uh, strong, it was possible to criticize uh, your government even in the aftermath of 9-11 and get great paying jobs at universities or whatever. <laughs> and you could still uh, do that. And, and our, our political system worked. We didn't overreact, and we certainly didn't overreact by our historical standards. And so if you compare what happened in World War II to the Japanese Americans or to German Americans uh, in World War I and so forth, that, that the, the political system here has been more vibrant, I, I would say, uh, and has a better record uh, over the last decade than even in previous times. Okay, we have to stop here, but thank you all for coming. I hope you'll stick around for the, the final session of the day, and please join me in thanking the panelists. Fun. Turn out to be good. Turn out.